Yeah, right. a lot of studies it's, showing that uh, activity, uh, especially aerobic exercise, is helpful in reducing problems with uh, brain perfusion in dementia, especially vascular dementia. So it, one person even said the legs pump the brain, maybe not anatom anatomically correct, but you see that your brain gets sharper. When we work out, our brains get sharper. Evan, you had something to say? Yeah, kids need to be taught that head trauma in general is something to be strongly avoided. And I tried to teach my kid that by teaching him that the inside of his skull was rough. The outside is smooth, but the inside is rough. And when you bang your head anytime, anywhere, it's going to rub on that bottom of the skull and the bottom of the skull is going to cause damage to that brain. Soccer could be played like basketball. Soccer could be played without heading the ball. It would be a beautiful, wonderful sport. You can still do bicycle kicks. You can do everything. There's no reason that you must use your head in soccer. Football could be played without helmets. The helmet in football is what creates the lack of normal fear of hitting your head, right? A normal person will not voluntarily strike their head against things repeatedly. But we put the helmet on them and we fool these people into thinking that that's protecting them. And it's not. So all these sports can be modified to make them fine. But, you know, punching someone in the head in, in, in the goal to create an injury to the head as the purpose of a sport strikes me as not something that we should be doing now. Not when there's tennis. Okay. Um, just one correction. I said 202 or 203. It's 110 out of 111 brains. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Message um, is the same, I think. I, so, I mean, statistically worse, but more accurate of a statistic. So, <laughs> um, so Dr. Furman um, talks about uh, vegans that he's treated. You know, some of them, you know, the, people in the plant-based world, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, um, think they're bulletproof. I think they're not going to get, you know, get all these diseases that everyone that everyone uh, is going to get. But Dr. Furman has some patients that are long term vegans that he's treated um, over time that have ended up with dementia. What are your thoughts on why this is happening and how do we prevent it? And he also mentions his thought is that they're having problems with uh, EPA and DHA conversion so that he suggests a supplement as an important part of the solution. Um, so I think the, um, the answer is vitamin B12. And if people are not eating vitamin B12 in their diet, they need to supplement. If they don't supplement with vitamin B12, mostly vegans are getting plenty of folate. Vitamin B12 and folate can process homocysteine to create SAMe, S adenosyl methionine. This SAMe goes on to methylate and quench the genes that actually make the beta and gamma secretase that make the amyloid, the beta amyloid, to make the amyloid plaques. So in our trial, for instance, we made sure everyone was getting enough vitamin B12 and real folate, not folic acid, uh, so that they could create SAMe themselves. We went to the extent in our trial of, of also supplying SAMe as a pill form, uh, as long as people weren't taking antidepressants that's uh, allowed. So this is one way that vegans, long-term vegans can get in trouble in the neurological system if they're not taking a supplement of vitamin B12. And I know what you, what you mean. Some people think they're, they're bulletproof. I know some people who eat just fruit and think that they don't need anything but fruit in their diet. And with, that's with no supplements whatsoever. And it, they're, they're not getting enough calcium. These particular people are not even getting enough protein, which is extremely rare. So, so what are your thoughts on, uh, on uh, EPA and DHA? Is that a necessary supplement? Well, I actually, um, you know, I wrote a book, Fats and Oils Demystified, on this. And in order for us to convert alpha-linolenic acid into EPA, icosapentaenoic acid, and, and then on to DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, first of all, we need a source of ALA in our diets, uh, alpha-linolenic acid, the basic plant omega-3. Ground up organic flax seeds is perhaps the best source. Walnuts are a good source. But we also, in order to convert this alpha-linolenic acid into EPA, it's a three-step process. And the first one uses delta-60 saturase to go in there and desaturate another part of the alpha-linolenic acid. Then it's elongated.
case, and then delta-5 desaturate. Then you have EPA. To do this, we need vitamins B3, vitamin B6, we need vitamin E, we need biotin, a B vitamin, and vitamin B12. Also, we need magnesium, zinc, iron, calcium, and copper. If we have all of these nutrients, then we can convert our basic plant omega-3 into EPA and onto DHA. However, things interfere in the diet too. Excess linoleic acid, very common in diets I've analyzed, and this is found, for instance, in plant oils. Uh, a lot of people use a lot of plant oils. Excess arachidonic acid found in animal fat and cholesterol. Excess cholesterol is always a problem. Trans fats also interfere with this process of making our own each EPA. And if uh, there's alcoholism or there's a problem with diabetes or other liver problems, this process of conversion is, takes place in the liver. And in order for us to make our own EPA, our livers have to be healthy. So for people with unhealthy livers may need to supplement with EPA and DHA, why not supplement with them? Two reasons. The pollution of EPA from fish oil is just horrible. You've got your PCBs and your organochlorines and mercury and all kinds of terrible stuff in there. If it's from krill oil, you have fluorine. So it is a real problem. Also, even if it's algal oil and EPA and DHA from that, you have rancidity. Rancidity is a big problem and the most fragile oils are EPA and DHA because they're highly unsaturated state, five and six points of desaturation. So it really is important for us to make our own EPA and DHA in our bodies if we can just get these nutrients. And this is one of the reasons why I take a supplement, brain and body food, so that I can get all of the above nutrients every day. So I can make my own EPA and DHA, which we all know are extremely important for the brain, especially docosahexaenoic acid. I, I could go on, but I'll let you two talk too. Thank well, you. Also, I just, so I just want to get a clarification. So you think that the EPA and DHA isn't a huge issue, except your way of going about getting getting it is actually to get the precursors in there so they can actually, so you can synthesize it yourself. Right. And when we look at Americans, how much EPA in most Americans is synthesized in the body and how much is eaten in the diet, most of it is synthesized in the body. And that's with Americans who are not getting all of the above nutrients so well and getting a lot of the new anti-nutrients that interfere with the process. So making it is always the best solution unless you have liver damage. However, you need those nutrients and to stay away from those contaminants, basically animal fat and trans fats in order to be able to make it yourself. And Ray, Evan, anything, anything to add? I would add that nobody heard a thing about an omega-3 fat in their whole life until Olaf Bang did a study where he thought that the Inuit were protected from heart disease because the Greenlanders went to the hospital and they had heart attacks and the Inuit didn't. The rate of heart disease in the Inuit is exactly the same as the Greenlanders. They're just Inuit, so they don't go to the hospital. So well, the there's entire... another reason there, Evan, a really funny reason. The average age of death of Inuits 26 years old. And again, a lot fewer heart be... attacks in 26 year olds. But the, the Inuit live in the most challenging environment in the world and they deserve nothing but respect and they have um, an amazing culture. No one should be saying anything negative about the Inuit, but they are not a culture that is, you know, highly westernized or goes to hospitals regularly. So Olaf Bang's original postulate was that the reason the Inuit were protected was because they got omega 3s. Now, the history of randomized controlled trials on omega-3 supplementation is a history of complete disaster until the Vasipa trial that was done by Amrin. And the Amrin Vasipa trial used mineral oil as a comparative, and mineral oil raises LDL cholesterol. So it is entirely possible all the benefits of the Amrin trial on Vasipa were due to the negative effects of the mineral oil. And nobody's replicated that study with a proper comparator oil. Mm -hmm. So I don't know enough to say what is the situation with EPA and DHA. And I don't wanna commit a genetic fallacy by saying that because Olaf Bang didn't do very good research, we should ignore omega-3s. But their actual scientific record is not great and you do have to postulate that your enzymes that convert ALA to these fats 
are deficient somehow or faulty to say that you need supplementation beyond LA and ALA. Yeah, and you can also jump a step up. When Delta 60 saturase is the limiting factor in enzymes in converging ALA to EPA, and that creates steridonic acid. Well, you can eat steridonic acid directly and jump a step if you want to boost your EPA. This is another way to do it without rancidity and without pollution, and you're much closer to guaranteed to raising your EPA and DHA if you're using steridonic acid, uh, say from perilla seeds, uh, in order to get your EPA and DHA manufactured in your body more effectively. The problem is the Delta-60 saturase gets used up if you eat too much of the omega-6 fatty acids commonly found in uh, oil, food oil. So there's, no, there's no deficiency syndrome of EPA or DHA that's found in anybody who's not getting all their nutrition uh, by mouth. There are people who get a deficiency from it when they're getting their uh, nutrition through a, through a vein, but there is no deficiency from people who are eating food, uh, getting deficient from EPA and DHA and needing that treatment to fix the deficiency. It's, it's, it's really eating. tough. How relevant is blood EPA to brain EPA? You really need to biopsy their brain cells to find out. And I just want to mention EPA and DHA are essential nutrients for infants, just not adults. Okay, we got about six minutes left, and I, I want to discuss treatment, okay? So in a very terse way, because there's three of you, and I'm sure you, you have opinions on this, um, what are the most effective treatments for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? And are there, you know, our audience it likes to find more natural ways, ideally, they're not, I don't think they're huge fans of, you know, the pharmaceutical approach. What Are, are there any natural remedies that, that work as well? And, and uh, I guess uh, I, I'm going to go to Ray. So the, the biggest, best thing you can do for Parkinson's, uh, I think maybe even better than medicines, um, is exercise. So uh, vigorous exercise can decrease your risk of ever developing that Parkinson's disease in the first place. And uh, numerous studies have shown that exercise, everything from weight training to vigorous exercise, running and swimming three and a half hours uh, a week, um, tai Chi, yoga, dancing, uh, bicycling, rock steady boxing, not getting hit in the head uh, are all <laughs> tremendously advantageous uh, to it. I'd also avoid uh, pesticides. I put a water filter on my water. I, I buy organic because uh, I can afford to do so. But even then, because organic produce still has pesticides on it, I wash all my fruits and vegetables with water and a pesticide wash. You can just get, you know, it's just an oil, just like soap for your vegetables. Um, so those are uh, avoiding head trauma, wearing a helmet if you ski, skate, or bike. Um, there are tons and tons of things that you can do even before you e ever take a put a pill in your mouth to help yourself from uh, Parkinson's disease and, and likely to Alzheimer's disease. I Obviously, I know Parkinson's a lot better. Right. That brain-derived neurotropic factor is increased by exercise. It's very protective to the brain and very helpful. Uh, one of the natural treatments that's uh, worked as well as donepezole and the other acetylcholinesterase inhibitors is ginkgo biloba. As a standardized extract, we included it in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial that I designed and ran, and it was one of many things. But even as a standalone, it seems to really help. The way it does this is through increasing brain perfusion by getting the blood through those clogged arterioles and capillaries, and so it should not be used with other blood thinners uh, as well. We did also use uh, go to cola as a medical plant, which is also very neuro, both of them are very neuroprotective. So they're helping us not to lose more brain cells. We can stabilize the loss of brain cells, both in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. We can stabilize the disease. So we used a multitude of antioxidants and antioxidant support enzymes too, to, to do this, to stop it. And the folate and the vitamin B12 to stop the production of more amyloid beta, which isn't just to stop the formation of amyloid plaque. It's also those toxic fibrils and aggregates that are really toxic to the brain before they become plaque. And where you can stop the production of those almost right away with these two B vitamins that are perfectly safe. And then all of a sudden you're not making these toxic products in your brain. Those are just a few of the natural ways that we can work with this. 
All right. And um, so we have about two minutes left. So I'd like to give you guys uh, each like a minute with final thoughts on on anything you want to add to tonight's conversation. So Evan, you didn't get a chance to speak. So if you want to give a quick final statement on anything, it could be, you know, Parkinson's, uh, it could be if you want to talk about the fats and their contribution, anything, you can go ahead and do that. So both of my grandmas and my dad had uh, senile dementia. Um, and so my experience with that is very, very high. Also treated all the time and treated every day. My, my personal opinion is an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. There is no question that the single biggest risk factor for that type of dementia is your midlife cholesterol level. So what has to happen is we have to start taking cholesterol seriously in people's teens and twenties. And we have to start being much more aggressive about what we allow, letting someone sit around with a cholesterol of 105 to 107 for decades is just asking for low level vascular uh, disease to develop. And the problem is that there's a subset of people who don't die of a heart attack and don't die of a stroke. And those people then manifest their vascular disease as dementia. And what we have to realize is all of those are preventable and they're all preventable through the same basic strategy, which is Let's deindustrialize the food system and go back to the pre-industrial food while we maintain the other health benefits like sewage and good homes and all those things that the industrial revolution has given us. And it's very, very hard to do on a patient by patient basis. We have to look at systemic change to really get huge differences. Right. You're next. I think most of Parkinson's is preventable. I'll say that again. I think most of Parkinson's disease is preventable. If we cleaned our air, if we cleaned our food, um, if we cleaned our water, we would live in a world where Parkinson's disease is increasingly rare instead of increasingly common. Um, and we could probably do the same for uh, a lot of Alzheimer's disease. I think we do this a lot of this for ALS. I think we could do this for a lot of diseases. You know, life expectancy today is uh, shorter than when it was in high school. When I was in medical school, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, we can all live longer and more importantly, healthier lives as humans as across the globe if we paid a lot more attention to the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the water we drink. And how do we do that? We do it by eating a whole food plant diet. We do it by avoiding animal fats entirely. And we do it by eating organic foods, as Ray mentioned, and I totally agree with Evan too, that we need to keep our diet more primitive, okay? Less industrialized, at least. So what we wanna do is eat as whole a plant food as we can and avoid the other things. I do know that certain supplements are necessary in order to supplement our diets to keep us in optimum health and thinking clearly into old age. And we need to get that food moving through our bodies and up into our brains with plenty of good exercise within our aerobic limits. We don't want to overdo anything, but we do need that exercise to keep ourselves healthy. I like to run. All right, great. And that concludes our our panel this evening. So Steve, Ray, Evan, I want to thank all of you. Can we unmute the uh, the audience, please? Thank all three of you. You guys. Thank you.